Uh, a few announcements for you. Our friends at the uh, Political Science Club are having a, a debate on Monday, March 21st. And uh, it's going to be held in Old Mouton, room 117, at 4 o'clock p.m. And uh, the debaters are Dr. Brian Paul Frost of Political Science and Dr. Rick Swanson of Political Science. And their topic is somewhat related to what we're going to talk about today, uh, which is, is, well, their topic is, is religion a net positive or a net negative for political society? So, should be a, a very interesting debate. Um, so you're all welcome to attend to that. And I got the information if you need it. Also, uh, if you'd like uh, uh, information about future Philosophy Club events, and you're not already on our email list, feel free to sign up, and I'll email you about all future Philosophy Club events. Also, if you uh, uh, are uh, open for some extra credit, which we love, and this will be going around. Also, uh, if you're in honors, uh, I believe there's a deal with uh, honors that you can get some uh, uh, credit. And the way I'm supposed to announce, the way that works is that you are supposed to email a synopsis of today's talk to uh, Dr. Frederick. <coughs> and I don't have her email address, but if you're in our room, you probably already have it. And uh, uh, there you go. Okay. And also, uh, uh, our speaker today <coughs> uh, is uh, uh, a well-known atheist author. He's published a couple of books, including uh, Why I Became an Atheist, A Former Preacher Rejects Christianity. And a uh, really good anthology called The Christian Delusion Why Faith Fails. And if you'd like to buy some of these, they're on sale for uh, $20 up here. I don't see any of it. I'll say it too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, to introduce our guest speaker today uh, is Jamie Paul. Up the range. Thank you all for coming. Alongside Dr. Keith Quartzy and Health and Philosophy Club. Um, John uh, wrote two books, as he mentioned. He has two master's degrees in philosophy and a master's degree in theology. And it was a great honor to introduce you to you, John Lawrence. Uh, look at me and say, 
say, how could you have ever believed that? And then, at the same time, turn right around and claim it's a delusion. You know, I mean, like, are, you, are you rational? <laughs> are, are you a reasonable person? I remember meeting someone on, on my lecture uh, circuit. Uh, he was a former Mormon bishop. And I began looking at him, you know, thinking to myself, you're weird. <laughs> How could you have worn the, the tiny wings that, made, that were magical, you know, and, and stuff like that? And, um, you know, then some people, the skeptics, they'll look at me and say, uh, you're weird. <laughs> it's a delusion. That's what I've come to conclude. And uh, that's what I uh, intend to argue here tonight. I'm going to tell you my story briefly from uh, the Why I Became an Atheist book, and then I'm going to uh, articulate uh, what's considered my signature argument uh, that I uh, luckily uh, stumbled on. <clears throat> Most discoveries are stumbled on, by the way. You know, you just have to be lucky to be the one to stumble on it. Uh, you know, when I first uh, derived this argument, I thought nothing of it at the time. You know, a lot of, a lot of discoveries are like that. And, uh, although I, I found uh, since that time it's not new, everybody who has ever rejected religion has done so from an outsider. <laughs> So it's been around a long time. I'm going to tell you about that. It's not <coughs> now, delusion, as I define it, as Webster's and others define it, is a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contrary evidence. Um, and uh, that's what I think Christianity is. And I think that the more conservative brand of Christianity, the more delusional it is. I think that uh, some liberal... Uh, Humanist uh, Christianity are not as delusional as the uh, right wing uh, conservative brand uh, is. And so I take aim at the uh, evangelical brand, even though at one time I was a liberal myself and I moved into agnosticism and then finally an ended in, in atheism. So I know how to argue against the liberals, I just don't bother. That's all there is to it. Um, I just don't bother. It's in my niche. You know, I know more about the evangelical faith having studied with some uh, really important evangelical scholars, Paul Feinberger, if you know who he is. Uh, Kenneth Concer was the dean of evangelicalism, the editor of Christianity Today. Took uh, class with him. Uh, William Lane Craig I took half of my hours uh, with him at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Ron Feinberg, or, uh, Ron Feenstra at uh, Marquette University was the token evangelical. So I have uh, an insight into uh, the evangelical faith. So I. I argue against it because I think it's the most uh, pernicious uh, view of, of religion that dominates in America today. And I, uh, I just started this uh, uh, this week. I just started on a new book. I gained about seven authors uh, where we're going to try to make the case that uh, that kind of Christianity is harmful. So you look forward to that as you will. Um, now, a delusion. Uh, what, what, what then, uh, how can you be rational now and not rational before? Well, I'm entirely the same person. I, I entirely think the same as far as my critical thinking abilities, having taught critical thinking in college classes. Uh, what the difference is, is how you see things. And once you see things differently, then you see the evidence in a different light, and the evidence becomes overwhelming that uh, you were wrong. Uh, psychi psychiatrist Valerie Chirico wrote it in her book, she said, it doesn't take very many false assumptions to send us on a long goose chase. Uh, she tells us about the mental world of a paranoid schizophrenic, and uh, to such a person, the perceived persecution by the CIA sounds real. She says, you can sit as a psychiatrist with a diagnostic manual next to you and think as bizarre as this sounds, the CIA really is bugging this guy. The arguments are tight, the logic persuasive, the evidence organized into neat files. All that's needed is, is to build an impressive house of illusion is a clear, well-organized mind and a few false assumptions. So I argue it has to do with how you see things. Uh, have you ever seen uh, some of those diagrams like uh, you look at it one way it's a duck, you look at it the other way it's a rabbit. It's how you see things. And when you see things differently, it all becomes clear. It becomes, uh, it, 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 you, you find out that it's a delusion, basically. The evidence is overwhelmingly against it. Now, when confronted with the evidence, to the contrary, believers have concocted different rationalizations to continue believing. One is called the, the omniscience escape clause. That's that God knows more than you know us and His ways are beyond us, and 
because of that, then the, you know, even though we don't understand something like, say, the Trinity or the Incarnation or the Atonement or the problem of evil, God knows what he's doing. It's called the Omniscient Escape Clause. Uh, another uh, uh, concocted rationalization is the faith trump card. It's similar in kind, you know. You just got to have faith when confronted with an argument to the contrary. You just got to have faith. You just got to have faith. Well, I didn't have enough faith to have that faith. So, um, because of this, because that's the case, because of these escape clauses and the trump card, believers must be convinced that their faith is nearly impossible before they will see that it's improbable. They must be convinced that it's impossible before they will see it as improbable. Now, I want you to think about something. Your banker comes to you and says, now, it's probably the case if you invest your money in this fund, you will go into financial ruin. Think about that. It's probably the case if you do this, you will go into financial ruin. So the guy goes out and he invests his money anyway. The banker comes to him and says, what are you doing? I said you're going to probably end up in financial ruin. Yes, you said that. But you didn't say it's, it's, a, uh, it's impossible. You, know, you, you didn't make the case that it's certain. I'll say that that it's certain that if I invest, then I will uh, come into financial ruin. But for believers, because of these rationalizations, it's, uh, uh, they, they have to be almost convinced it's impossible before they see it's improbable. Now, I was once a deluded person. Now, I see things differently. I'm still very bit the same rational person I was before. I just see differently, and the difference makes all the difference in the world. The bottom line seems to me that the believer's concept of God becomes the answer to all his intellectual problems. If something bad happens, he, then God has a reason for it, or God will bring good out of it. Uh, God allows him to, ex or God allows him to experience suffering in order to strengthen him or her, or, her, or that it's punishment for sin. And before you know it, the problem of evil doesn't seem as problematic anymore. The same goes for unanswered prayer. Almost every scientific study on prayer shows that it's statistically no different than chance or luck that prayer, petitionary prayer is answered. But the believers say, well, you know, this wasn't God's will, or that God is not in God's timetable. It's uh, like counting the hits and discounting the misses. You know, if, the, if a prayer hits, you get uh, something in, in response, then therefore if God's good, if it's a miss, then God knows what's best. By definition, the theistic God must answer or solve all problems and difficulties. Otherwise, that God is not a worthy God concept. Given the fact that uh, the Bible is a huge book, there will always be some passage that says whatever the believer wants it to say. The problem, of course, is that there are many conflicting Bible verses to explain away. Now, the Christian thinks this, uh, but so does the Muslim. Their concept of God does the same. So does the Orthodox Jew. So does the Hindu. Uh, so is the Buddhist, you know, to, uh, to the degree that uh, the Buddhist has the view in, of uh, supernatural forces. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, but because religious believers have their problems solved by their, by their faith in that God concept, it's nearly impossible for, this, for them to see that it's their faith itself that solves these problems and not the object of their faith. I would try to make that case here tonight, in case you're, you're skeptical. And you should be. Now, uh, for me, my story goes like this. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was converted as a teen, dramatic conversion. Uh, you know, you can almost call me a drama queen uh, because of the drama in my conversion and the drama and involving my uh, deconversion, as it's called. Um, and I wanted to learn more about God. I wanted to learn more about the Bible, so I studied and studied. And I became a minister and. Uh, um, you know, I wanted to convert the world. I thought that I was uh, involved in something that was of cosmic uh, scope. You know, I mean, like something with eternal significance. How many of you would like to do something eternally significant? Well, a lot of us would. The uh, problem is, there is no eternal significance, so get over it. <laughs> That's uh, to be shown here tonight if I can. 